Welcome to the best of incredible Idaho. I'm Mike Connaughton, and tonight, from the comfort of the Idaho Country Inn in Sun Valley, we bring you a special edition of our show, featuring the season's best of incredible Idaho. You know, there's just something about a warm fire and the anticipation of the winter holidays that seems to bring out the storyteller in folks. And there's no doubt that some of the best natural storytellers are fishermen. Tonight, we start our show with a backcountry adventure. Some of the best cutthroat fishing can be found in our state's wilderness areas. But to get there, you either have to go in on horseback, hike, float the river, or in some special cases, you can fly. The Selway Bitterroot Primitive Area was part of the original Wilderness Bill signed by President Johnson in 1964. The intent of the legislation was to set aside pristine federal lands in their natural state. But this rugged country wasn't entirely undeveloped. Homesteaders staked claims around the turn of the century, establishing scattered pockets of private land up and down the drainages of the Selway. Eventually, backcountry landing strips were added as the airplane became the most practical method of travel to these remote outposts. When the primitive area became a wilderness, many of these holdings were grandfathered in, remaining private land. Oh, they've got a neat spot. Hi, Butch. How are you? This is the Selway Lodge. It was originally homesteaded in 1910 by a man named Henry Pettibone. At one time in its history, it became a commercial hunting lodge. Now, it's a private residence under the care of Butch and Penny Harper, who managed this historic property for the landowner. The front deck of the main lodge overlooks the clear, clean waters of the Selway River, prime habitat for Idaho state fish, the West Slope cutthroat trout. It's pretty nice to have this kind of fishing in your front yard, backyard. The private property includes the lodge, gardens and the landing strip. Fish this big pool here, this big long run. And once you cross this fence line, you're in the Selway yeah. Bitterroot Wilderness. Yeah, that's the spot. It's the kind of fishing you dream about. A perfect day, spectacular scenery, a secluded river, and a native trout that can't seem to resist anything you throw at it. Oh, there he is, got him. West Slope Cutthroat. Looks like about, oh, 10 inches long. Oh. Bill Hutchinson is a fisheries biologist with the Idaho Department of Fish and Game. Oh, they're gorgeous. Flip them over this way. The uh, orange stripe underneath the gill here, that's just a classic marking of a, of a cutthroat trout. And a rainbow will have a dark, I mean, a silver with a red stripe down here on the, uh, the lateral line. This is called the lateral line, that line right there. But the thing you look for mainly is right in here, the pattern of the spotting and the the cutthroat, I better get rid of him. We'll get another one. Catch and release. That's been the regulation on the Selway since the 1970s. And no there doubt it's the primary get reason this fish is so abundant here. There we go. Presently, every this one of Idaho's out. native trout species is, is either fish. listed under the Federal Endangered Species Act or proposed for listing, including the West Slope oh, cutthroat. Yeah. But state biologists don't believe that Idaho's West Slope cutthroat are in trouble. Years of data show healthy populations of the species in our state, not only on the Selway, but also the Locksaw, the St. Joe, Kelly Creek, and the Middle Fork of the Salmon. And this documentation will be included in the Fish and Game Department's official comments to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And what we're going to do is we will show that we have very strong populations of West Slope cutthroat still in their native range. So. Uh, we feel from our standpoint, from all the data that we've seen so far, is that uh, Idaho should be excluded from the listing. Uh, the other states, they'll have to, to look at their own populations, but we in Idaho feel very strongly that uh, the species as a whole is not in any danger of, uh, of extinction. It should not even be listed as a, as a threatened species. It's like another cutthroat. Smaller one, so uh, what that tells us is there are several year classes in here. We get good recruitment. Recruitment is a scientist's way of saying that the trout are reproducing. And this is all catching and The various sizes indicate that they've been reproducing consistently year after year. 
another sign of a healthy population. There he goes back. In fact, the prize for catching the granddaddy cutthroat goes to Penny Harper. Don't let the dog eat him. How big is he? Uh -huh. She reels in the biggest catch of the day, despite some nosy interference from her dog, Hack. Sometimes those retriever instincts are a little hard to leash. It's probably 16 inches, I think. Yeah, pretty good size. Pretty good size cutthroat for this river. No. Probably a male. It's got a little bit of a kite. It's a beautiful fish, colorful and vibrant. In the spring, during the spawning right. season, it will be even more brilliant. Butch releases okay. the big male into the sparkling clear water, one of the most important criteria for healthy cutthroat populations. Water's clean, clear, cold. Doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that uh, we maintain this kind of habitat for these fish. They'll do what Mother Nature's been letting them do for thousands and thousands of years. And uh, it's our job to protect them and to give them that uh, type of environment so that they can prosper. It's not only perfect habitat for cutthroat trout. Before the dams were built, these waters teemed with spawning salmon and steelhead. The healthy habitat is still here, but the big ocean-going fish are hard to find. It's a tough trip for salmon and steelhead through a series of eight dams to and from the sea. And it's taken its toll. The numbers slowly dwindling until the big fish have almost disappeared completely from these waters. Oh, it'd be wonderful. I mean, these big pools, the pool right above the bridge, or under the bridge here, probably, I bet, in, uh, you know, 50 years ago, must have had a couple hundred fish in it this time of year. Or maybe a little bit earlier, but... And I imagine the, you know, the bears wouldn't be giving us so much trouble if they had all that protein in the river to feed on instead of our apples. <laughs> Bears, like this fellow, would be feeding on rotting carcasses of spawned out salmon and steelhead. Those same decaying carcasses contributed critical nutrients to the river, spinning a web of life that has now been seriously interrupted. And wouldn't it be something to be casting for a 40-inch fish in an extraordinary mountain setting like this? But all that doesn't take away from the fun of catching cutthroat in Idaho's magnificent backyard. <clears throat> All the rest of Idaho fish pretty much, you know, the browns, the brook trout, the rainbow, all are introduced. They've all come from some other place. But, but these were here, you know, and Lewis and Clark was here. And they're named after Lewis and Clark, in fact. And I think that's pretty neat to fish for a fish that's been around for at least 200 years and probably 10 or 20,000 years before that. Butch Harper figures he's been casting a fly rod for over 40 years. Oh, just came out. Oh, he's got it. You go away. Go on, you don't get one. He's gone. Go back to the bank. Hack, <laughs> on the other hand, Hack. is less experienced oh, and gone. seems to prefer a more direct fishing method, like poaching what others catch. I caught a couple steelhead last year, and he, he's out there. Steelhead are 30 feet off the beach, you know, rolling. He's out there swimming around. <laughs> oh, he's funny. But he's so much fun to have around, I can't, I just can't leave him home. Butch Harper is the classic image of a skilled fly fisherman at his best. A hatch is on, and he stands in the midst of a mountain stream, backlit by the sun, casting gracefully and with little apparent effort. It's a perfect picture of the peace and serenity that can be found in the quiet rhythm of a fly rod. I think anybody that, you know, fly fished a lot would tell you that an awful lot of enjoyment is just casting a nice fly rod. It's, it's fun. It feels good. It's, uh, it's not as easy as people think to do, to learn anyway. It's not hard to do, but it really is a pleasant sensation. Come on, fish. Man, I can... Occasionally, if you're lucky, if there's a fish or two to go along with it. That helps. <laughs> We're talking a major cutthroat here. Well, maybe it's a, let me look here. Maybe it's a uh, steelhead. Small, no, it's not.
Not sure he's released yet. Up next, biologists study elk calf survival in Idaho's Clearwater country. In the heart of our state is an area called the Three Rivers Country. One of those rivers is the Selway, a great place to fish for cutthroat, as you saw in our last story. The other two are the Locksaw and Clearwater, rivers that have carved their paths into a landscape of extraordinary beauty. It's classic river country. Steep-sided slopes are blanketed with thick forests, lush green in early summer. The terrain is remote and difficult, an area that to the casual observer appears to be exceptional habitat for Idaho's prized big game animal, the Rocky Mountain elk. But although on a statewide basis, the Idaho elk herds are near historic highs, here, the elk numbers have plummeted. Even before the decline was documented, biologists had observed a marked drop in cow-calf ratios during routine aerial surveys and had begun designing a study to determine the reasons. Now that research has taken on a new urgency. Yeah, the main idea is we have two study areas. And and one, in, the main idea is to compare the survival of calves and pregnancy in both areas. We picked this part of the lock sock to represent these half a dozen units in central Idaho where calf-cow ratios have been declining. We picked the south fork of the Clearwater to represent those units where things are generally doing pretty well. The calf-cow ratio is one of the measurements scientists use to determine the health of an elk herd. Ideally, biologists would like to see a ratio of 30 to 40 calves per 100 cows. On the lock saw, the ratio had dropped to 9 calves per 100 cows, indicating an elk herd in significant trouble. Our state is divided into 28 elk management zones. Hunting units 10 and 12, here in purple, make up the Lolo zone. This represents a larger area of concern where elk numbers are declining, the lock saw river country. In blue, just south and a little west, is the Elk City Zone, the second study region. It's composed of drainages that feed the south fork of the Clearwater River. This is representative of areas where cow-calf ratios are good, and elk numbers remain relatively stable. The differences between the two study areas is readily apparent from the air. There's more open country here near the south fork of the Clearwater, a mix of forest and old burns. And although mountainous, the slopes seem more gradual, not abrupt and steep like the crags hugging the Locksaw. Yeah, what we're doing here. So the here now is just trying to locate the, the calves here back in the Clearly the best way to study the factors influencing calf survival is to go to the source, the newborn calves themselves. So researchers are attempting to catch and radio collar 30 calves in each study area, and then follow their progress through next winter. Now free of the underbrush, it's evident this nimble little calf has already been radio collared. It eludes the biologists on the ground, and although only a few days old, it has the strength and endurance to easily escape these human predators. Okay, now that calf had a collar on it, so it's one way it collared. We didn't know it for sure. Yeah, right, it did. Yeah, we're trying to capture them very early because if you wait until they're older, you've missed all the things that could possibly occur when they're one, two, three days old. So we're trying to catch them at one, two, three, four, five days old. There were two of them here? Yeah, there were two of them. The second of the two calves is out of the side of the ground crew, and they must depend on pilot Jim Pope's direction to guide them into the little guy's hiding place. Okay, eight uh, calves still in the I read you loud and clear. Is it the snag right above us here? Yeah, you're, that's the right snag right there. Looking up the hill, it's about three feet. One reason for capturing the calf so young is to determine what kind of shape it was in at birth. Just like a human baby, low birth weight can be an indication of the mother's poor condition. If they find calves weigh significantly more in one area than another, it may imply problems in a particular habitat. You see, you're coming up on the end of the 
The pilot's job is to separate the calf from its mother. At this tender age, the little elk's first defense against predators is to bed down and remain motionless. Once the cow is gone, Jim circles the calf with the helicopter, while research biologist Pete Zager creeps up from behind. Jim lands his ship nearby and hurries to help. For over 30 years, pilot Jim Pope has been a regular on fish and game projects, and over time, his role is blurred, shifting between pilot and research assistant. It's a kicker. Is it? Yeah. Well, we're trying to find a juggler so he can get some blood. I'm not very good at this, but Pope's real good at it. So. Whenever he's along, we, <laughs> we let him do the deed. The blood will be sent to laboratories for nutritional and conditioning tests. Then various measurements are taken to help pinpoint the calf's age. This is critical for determining an accurate birth weight since they can gain over four pounds a day. I said the blindfold helps keep them calm a little bit. They don't fight you quite a bit. After examining the scab on the calf's navel, checking its teeth and hooves, and evaluating its strength, Pete guesses the small bull to be around four days old. It will be aged more accurately later when the precise hoof and teeth measurements are entered into a computer profile. Okay, this is the collar that we're using, and it's the guy has the expandable um, strap on top. So when they grow, it'll expand. It'll eventually fall off, and this will rot away. We use the rubber surgical tubing to uh, adjust the size, because these, if you don't adjust the size at this age, the collar will slip off on them, and, and we'll be uh, looking for another calf. The team works quickly and efficiently. It's important to get in and get out so calf and cow can reunite. 57. Oh, I believe it. It's big calf. <laughs> big calf. Normal weights right now for a newborn would be about, what, 30? 30, 35. And this year they've been running 40 and 45. So this is a little bit older, you think? No, they just seem to be bigger this year so far. Seem to be heavier. Pete removes the hobbles holding the calf's feet, but the little guy hesitates. Not sure he's released yet. Somewhere nearby, mom's watching. Before too long, calf and cow will be back together. Well, now we monitor, monitor him basically every day for about six weeks or so. That's when most of the mortality tends to occur, so we really want to focus on that period. And then we'll back off every couple days, and then maybe every couple times a week, and then maybe once a week as the year progresses. But um, most of the mortality for these youngsters happens in the first six weeks or so, so that's where we really focus intensely. Up next, the lock saw. Thick forests and steep slopes make capturing elk calves a challenge. Good job. You got them. Again, the idea behind the elk project is to compare pregnancy rates and calf survival in the two study areas. So ideally, it would be nice to catch and release an equal number of calves in each region. But that could prove to be a bit tougher along the lock saw. Adjustments are made to accommodate the tougher terrain. The shorter blades and compact tail of the Hughes 500 helicopter make landing in small, steep clearings a bit less difficult, but certainly not easy. That's you, Lewis. Yeah. A6 Fox is off Ball Mountain Telebase. Now be working the Ball Mountain training. It's, uh, it's uh, hard to find the landing spot, so sometimes you have to drop the guys off quite a ways away, and they get quite a hike. Mm -hmm. The first animal spotted from the air is a cow elk. Now the question is, does she have a calf hidden nearby? We first try to look for a cow that looks like she tries to stick with a certain spot. We test her with the helicopter. If she sticks around, we search for the calf. The cow doesn't display the classic behavior of a mother protecting its young, so the ship moves on. There's a bull just to your right also. 
And this habitat in the locks, though, is a bit different from the South Fork. It was all created in the early part of the century by big fires. And as you can see when we refine, uh, these brush fields now are 15 feet tall saplings. And uh, there's some people that feel that even though the world looks green out there, nutritionally, it's not all that good. We just don't know. Finally, an almost impossibly perfect situation. A cow is spotted nursing a very young calf. All right, we're gonna have to get to that cow. Pilot Randy Porter swings the ship around to try and separate the cow and calf. The mother immediately runs off in an attempt to draw attention away from her offspring. But of course, the ploy doesn't work. The helicopter hovers above the calf until research biologist Mike Gratson is certain it's bedded down. We can keep tracking him. I can get out and grab him because I don't think he can run away from me. Again, teamwork is the key. On the ground, Mike depends on the pilot to guide him back to the calf. Okay, he's almost landed. He's not down yet. Just stay right here. Don't yeah, we'll lay down. But you do really need a good rapport between the crew that's working on biologists and the helicopter pilot because we're out there in difficult terrain. Um, things need to be done, done as fast as possible, but as safe as possible. Uh, because of the expense per hour. So it's, and we've got a good crew here on the lock saw and of course the South Fork. Good job. That's nice. You got him. Mike works quickly processing the little bull calf. He takes the same exact measurements that the first crew records on calves captured in the other study area. Navel. I think we'll probably be scabbed over. Since it's not a it's not a newborn calf, it's at least a day old. Probably probably two or three days, two day old calf. Let's take a look at the navel. See the navel there? It's not scabbed over, but it's just starting to scab. So it's probably really only about a day old calf. Yeah, so Research biologist like Mike Gratson is the consummate scientist. He says not a day goes by when he isn't we thinking about this elk project. This he spent really untold hours designing methods yeah. for gathering information. A little bull calf. And then the next step, trying yeah, to objectively the, weigh all the data the collected and come up with answers, reasons for the fluctuation in elk numbers. Calf. Part of this aging to the day is measuring the, the hoof line or the growth line of the hoof. And that's basically from where you see the hair attaching And I'll try to get that in there right at this point up here to this line here. So we measure this distance. And what we've got on this one is about 10.6 millimeters. The temptation, of course, is to come up with an easy answer, perhaps blaming bears or mountain lions for preying on the calves. And Mike acknowledges that predators may be a part of the problem. But is that because of an increase in predator numbers, or are there fewer calves to begin with because the cows aren't becoming pregnant? Or could it be that the newborn calves are in poor condition, easy targets for predators? The reason may be much more complicated than it first appears. Well, I think this calf will probably try to get up and just walk up slope, which is the direction of the cow. And we'll just go down slope. The little calf remains still, emitting a plaintive bleeding noise that slowly rises and wanders off. Okay, Randy, uh, we finished with this calf, so you can come back over and just land wherever you want. We'll uh, we'll go to where you land. We're in the we're in the little opening right beside the calf. The pilot reports that the cow has already reunited with her calf. That's capture number six for the Locksaw team, and the clock is running, with 24 more to score. We recently checked with research biologist Pete Zager to get an update on last summer's study. Preliminary results indicate that calf survival is significantly better on the Clearwater portion of the study than on the Locksaw. Interestingly enough, the scientists have also discovered that in early spring, 
the pregnant cows in the Clearwater country are in considerably better shape than those in the Locksaw. Could the nutritional well-being of the cows be playing a role in calf survival? It's an interesting point, but Pete warns that several more years of data and analysis are necessary before a solid conclusion can be reached. Oh, there's a Up fish. Next, Look at that. Look at that. Autumn oh, angling. Man. Spectacular scenery, right. big trout, and a good oh, companion. Oh, I got a big one. <laughs> good. Way to go. Now it's time to move from our summer stories into autumn. And fall takes us to a fisherman's paradise near McCall. 325 lakes and five major river drainages are within just minutes of the city. Waiting for you and your fly rod. There's a great big old caddis fly on the water. Is that right? The heat and intensity of summer is gone. In its place is a quiet waiting. It's the shoulder season, when the days can be warm, but the nights have the taste of the winter to come. Nature dresses herself in vibrant color, in brave defiance of her fate. Soon enough, the brilliant display will be dulled, then muffled in an endless layer of white. I don't think we're going to get mayflies today. We might get some snowflies, but I don't think we're going to get mayflies. <laughs> what do you think, Brad? Yeah, we're going to get they, some snowflakes? I, th I think with the rain, we, we may not have much chance for fish and dry. I'm going to put on a little, um, I'm going to start with that little zug bug I was showing you in the shop. Look at that big one. Rose but right keep there. in mind, it's fall. Oh, yeah. And in this one short afternoon of fishing, fishing, the weather will include rain, a dash of sleet, some sunshine, shifting winds, and then a striking stillness followed by a spectacular sunset. And fly fishermen Tuck Miller and Brad Gauss will match the whims of the weather pattern for pattern, enticing rainbow trout with wet flies, dry flies, and big nymphs. Oh, look, Brad, there's a mayfly floating on the surface. See right where my fly just landed? I'm going to watch him. If the fish take him, we know to switch to dry flies. For Tuck, fishing is his life and his livelihood. He's the co-owner of a fly shop. He teaches fly fishing, and he's a licensed fly fishing guide. But today is a well-deserved afternoon off from all of that. Today, Tuck's getting away from work and going, well, fishing. There's something nice about fish. They don't make you do the dishes. They don't care if your room's not clean. They don't care if your clothes match. Well, I think I got to start talking to him now. Tuck's fishing partner, Brad, also brings a bit of professional guidance to his fishing ventures. Being a, a, a recently retired dentist, I hate to see people chomping leader with their teeth. They fish together in quiet companionship, enjoying the stillness of an autumn day. Nice and calm. We've lost our wind. Fishing uh, <laughs> can be a real <laughs> stress reducer. A lot of fun, and it's fun if you don't hook a lot of fish. Those days that you uh, uh, do catch a lot of fish, that's fun too. Twenty fish days, and but where can you see a beautiful setting like this? Oh, there's a fish. Look at that. Look at that. Oh man! All right. Oh, Brad, I got a big one. Good, way to go. There he is, right? He's going to come up. Look at that roll from that fish. Yeah, you get a, you get a big like a fish nice like fish. this on a one weight, and I got to try to get him on the reel as fast as I can. And what these fish do here is they'll come in fairly close like this, and you hear that reel working. And do you, do you want some help? Now I can get it. It's a big rainbow trout. Each spring, with permission from Fish and Game, yeah, this, this small private pounds. pond on the edge of McCall is stocked by Tuck Shop, T. Right. Avery Fly Fishing Outfitters. Yeah, there's something about a fly rod that bends all the way to the handle that I enjoy. It kind of reminds me of steelhead fishing. It's the perfect place for go. Tuck this to teach beginners. No trees so nearby to snarl your back cast, plenty of beautiful fish, yeah. great scenery, and easy access to McCall. What I'll do is just reach right here. That hook will just slide out backwards. Oh, maybe not. Just sit back in the water and I'll get to my forceps. Okay, here he goes. The rain has finally stopped, but the wind picks up, making casting more difficult. That sky is kind of impressive with the sun just 
poking through. Yep. It's definitely a fall day. Oh man, I guess. Oh, there we go. Look at that one. Good. I saw him rising. He was feeding right out there. The problem is I'm so used to fighting a fish on my, with a line, I got to get him on my reel with this little rod. There we go. Oh, he's not as big as that last one. Oh, listen to him go. I got another one rising right out here by me though. He's fighting nice. Yeah, these fish here do this. They, it takes three to five minutes. It's pretty much an average to get a fish in. And... Tuck says that one of the secrets to fishing in the fall is to go into the places that are slow in the heat of summer. It means the fish probably haven't been feeding. And now that the weather is cooled, they're hungry, eager to put weight on for the winter. Looks like a good fish. It's a nice fish. It goes a couple, three pounds. Good. Check that out. Oh, really nice. Look, nice look how and fat. fat. He is. Yeah, really fat. Nice, pretty fish. Here he goes. Okay. He was just barely hooked, boys. I surprised I landed him. That must be the, the luck I'm owed for all the fish I've lost in my lifetime, huh? <laughs> just minutes later, Brad gets a hit. Right. <laughs> oh, we got you in the weeds a little bit, huh? Yeah, that's okay. Nice looking color on him. He's really, really red. I'm going to back up because all right. this, I you think got... we can bring him in. And all I'm right. just going to get him in. So, hell, maybe I'm not. <laughs> Fact is, I'm not even going oh, to get him there we go. In. That's called the, um, that's the very, that's, <laughs> that's a very a quick release. That's a long line release, you know, <laughs> because if you don't ever lose any fish fly fishing, you never get out and do it much. That's right. Once again, the weather changes. The wind is calm, smoothing the water. And a hush settles over the pond, and the still surface dances with reflections. The quiet seems to affect the fishermen. They abandon the playful chatter, settling instead for the peaceful harmony of good companions. It's this subtle sense of tranquility that defines fishing in the fall. The colors, the solitude, the uh, fish, especially if you get them working on top, uh, it, and it, there's a calmness and not an urgency that you have in the fall, fall that you do seem to have at other times. Right the piece is suddenly there. interrupted by a big somewhere. bruiser of a fish. Oh, there's a big one right there. Oh, is that my fly? Oh, is it was he after your fly? I couldn't tell. I would yeah. assume. Yeah, yeah, there's a big one rolled right out there. I would assume he was. There he is. Nice. Oh, nice one. <laughs> nice. See, that's why I like fishing dry flies, because you got that visual aspect of the whole thing and doing everything I can to keep him over here. Man, see, look at the oomph on this guy. I don't think he's as big as those yeah. last couple of fish. Look at him go. Look at that. He's got some shoulders oh, on Oh, man, him. look at what he's going to It may be a smaller rainbow than some of the others, but it's a fish Watch with this. a I'm lot of heart. I'm just going to reach right out here. Unhook him. He's just barely hooked in the side of the jaw. Oh, look at that. Nice. Just barely even hooked. The day is drawing to a close. The clouds split, and shafts of sunlight break free. The golden light slants over the water in a final radiant burst of reflected color. Somewhere beyond the trees, a bull elk shouts, a reminder that man is merely a guest in Idaho's wild places. The sun begins a slow, lingering retreat, highlighting the tip of a mountain that's lightly dusted with fresh snow. Nature's spectacular display prompts reflections of our own, confessions, if you will, that maybe it's not only about the fishing. You know, fly fishing and, and fishing for trout may not be the most spectacular sport in the world, but the places you get to do it are pretty unparalleled. You know, trout happen to live in places that are very pristine and very clear. They require and demand clean water, and if they don't have it, they're not there. And so trout fishing takes you to beautiful places, I guess, and that's the big allure of it. People. Coming up next, sheep muggers hang on for the ride of their lives. Winter is often one of the best times of the year to capture and to move wildlife because the animals are more concentrated. In our next series of stories, narrator Roland Barris takes us to Canada on a bighorn sheep capture. 39 sheep were brought in from British Columbia and released into Hell's Canyon. It was a venture funded and supported by the Foundation for North American Wild Sheep and part of a long-term plan to manage bighorns in the area. 
We join the story on day three. It's day three. The early morning light reveals a new challenge for the crew trying to trap the bighorn sheep. Jesus, quite a pile on that rocks right there. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Well, we'll just have to sit and wait. You know, we may have to just sit here and yeah, wait. If they come up empty-handed again, Boz may call the trapping operation off. Most of the volunteers have left, and even with a few local recruits, Boz is down to a skeleton crew. Come on, girls. Come on, girls. But the anxiety disappears as the bighorns come running for their breakfast treat. Yeah, we got 21 under the net right now. Just let this one come in and we'll take them. Come on, girls. Okay. Here we go, Kurt. guys okay start taking them that way <laughs> the most important thing that needs to happen once the nest drop is you have to get to the sheep and restrain them so that so that they don't cause themselves harm or harm to another sheep you need to effectively immobilize them physically immobilize those animals and get a blindfold on them once you put a blindfold on them they pretty much quit they'll quit struggling Fosman, young ram too Anything under three, three and a half will take. That's good. Roll one time. Perfect. Perfect. You're perfect. Okay. He's off his back. That's what we need. Okay, I'll get a knee right in here. Okay, easy, mister. Easy, mister. Okay. Easy, buddy. Easy, buddy. Heck of a price to pay for breakfast. Okay, go ahead and hobble him, and I'll do this guy with a blindfold. Come on, guy. I know you got blood. For the sheep, probably the biggest thing we need to watch for is body temperature increases in body temperature because we're stressing them. Their body temperatures go up, and they get into a compromised position physiologically that if we're not ready to deal with that, could effectively kill the animal. Each mugger constantly monitors their sheep's temperature. They ride it on the animal's horns so the veterinarians can quickly see if an animal is overheating. 1066? Okay, so she'll be okay. Dave Hunter is one of three vets on hand if there's a problem. And uh, of course, the sooner we get them in the trailer, the better. Not every sheep that's trapped will go to the States. We've had very, very poor success moving large rams. And so you just, the conventional wisdom is you just don't do that. Okay, guys, we have a hot one here. Can hand me a collar real quick. This one is going where? Moving a sick sheep or a dead sheep does us no good. We have to, we have to do everything in our power to, to okay. bring these sheep along in a healthy condition. And we've been doing this about 15 years and uh, the science of what you need to do to move a healthy sheep, we've got that down. We have a hot one here. We're gonna put these in a quiet place. We had a couple of them that were just so freaked out they couldn't even stand up. Uh, that's to be expected from a, from a quick drop, quick restraint. Temperature was only a problem on one. Okay, two, uh, go. A mix of relief and euphoria settles in with a job well done. Ecstatic. Nobody hurt, no people hurt, no sheep hurt. I'm happy. It was a rush. It was a rush. It was exciting because I know what these uh, sheep mean for the future of Idaho and for the Hell's Canyon project. Sinking, guys. Yeah, we're sinking. We're, we're, we gotta get to shore. Coming up next, a wild, wet ride to safety. We're sinking. The 39 sheep were transported in horse trailers for the 15-hour drive from the capture area in British Columbia to the release site in Hell's Canyon. And tonight, we close the 1998 edition of the Best of Incredible Idaho with the release of these wild sheep into the spectacular terrain of their historic home. We would like to see them uh, get to a level that they can maintain that population no matter 
what catastrophic event comes along so that 25 years from now, we won't have to be manipulating populations and doing transplants to sustain wildlife for posterity here in Idaho. And I think that's our ultimate goal. It will have its fluctuations, but basically a stable population that our grandkids can enjoy. It's going to be important for us to say we made an effort to do what was best for Bighorn Sheep, for Hell's Canyon. The transplant crew is closing in on the end of their journey, Hell's Canyon. Thousands of Rocky Mountain bighorns once climbed its craggy cliffs, but they were wiped out by overhunting and diseases brought in by domestic sheep. The last leg of this long journey is by boat. Its metal bottom has triggered some concerns. It's going to work like a heat sink. So if you'd allow us to lay down some, some chips, uh, you know, they're biodegradable. Trust me. I'm the captain agrees to let them put down cedar chips to make the ride more comfortable for the sheep. Put that down, and then we'll put this tarp in the bottom. OK. Layer on our side. No, no, down here. We've got a hobbler first. On the other side. Other side. Okay, watch your feet. Some of the people here today were part of the first bighorn transplant to Hell's Canyon 20 years ago. Now an estimated 700 wild sheep live scattered up and down the river. But disease continues to threaten their survival. During the last epidemic, 200 bighorns died from a strain of the disease Pasturella. Very similar to bringing smallpox to Native Americans. Uh, a virus or a bacteria that they don't normally see can be devastating to them. So, The bighorns from Canada face the same risk, but wildlife biologists have tried to minimize the threat by choosing isolated release sites. It's a huge area, so we mapped you know, vegetation, slope, water, all kinds of different factors that go into bighorn sheep habitat for this, but since we don't want these sheep to come into contact with the sheep that uh, were involved in the epidemic, um, these sites rated out higher than some other ones. They're great places. The crew steadily grows more excited as the boat descends into the wilds of Hell's Canyon. But then the unexpected happens. Sinking, guys. Yeah, we're sinking. We're, we got to get to shore. Minutes away from the release site, the boat takes on water. Bilge pumps clogged by the cedar chips have stopped working. We don't have any better place. Why not right there? We're along here is fine. Let's get out. The captain heads for the bank, but the river current threatens to swamp the boat. We're sinking. Running out of choices and time, the captain tries again. Don't worry about our sheep. They've got their snorkels on. OK, OK, wait, we got some help coming. Yeah, just keep their heads up. Come on, quick, guys. We need some help here. We got one in the back. Leon, take this one or oh. Watch your head, watch your head. Help him with the head. Chris, are you OK? OK. OK, help Corey here. He's by himself. Keep them on their stern until we get help. I don't know how to explain it, but it was a very, very bad moment for everyone. And um, we're really concerned about the sheep. One everyone, you, one even though we might have fallen the river, I don't think anyone is really thinking about people. Everyone was concerned about the sheep. Luckily, we got the boat to shore and got the sheep Francis. out, and they should be doing fine. Francis. Let's start letting them go. I don't think we have any choice. Let's do on this end first. So Fear can, can produce a narcotic-like state in bighorn sheep. They can succumb to it and die, or they can just snap out of it. Come on. Come on. Come on. Get. Okay. We're going to have to help them along, guys. You know, animals are stressed. Stress is a common factor. We think of it as a human trait, but animals are under stress all the time also. This is probably more than, than we'd like to impose upon bighorn sheep for a relocation effort, but physically, they're very strong animals. We saw how stressed, off, uh, stressed out they were, and as soon as they got their legs under them, they were jumping up that hill. 
Near tragedy took the joy out of releasing these wild sheep, but farther upriver in Oregon, it was a happy occasion. I feel really good, especially to get them on the hill, because I, I always worry about them until they do, because so many things can happen. Yes, they're going to do super. They may be missing the rose bushes and lawns of Spencer's Bridge now, though. Um, it's a positive thing that you can do as a biologist. It's something really tangible to restore an animal to its historic range. The sight of bighorns taking off into the wilds of Hell's Canyon is the culmination of three years of planning and goodwill between three states, two countries, and hundreds of individuals. It brings everyone a step closer to securing the future for wild sheep in a place they once roamed for centuries. you can take home the wonder of our magnificent natural heritage. The 1998 Encore edition of Incredible Idaho features the wildlife and wild places of Idaho. Host Mike Connaughton guides you through the mountains, canyons, and high deserts of Idaho, introducing you to our fascinating wild heritage. It makes a great gift and a welcome addition to any home video library. To order your tape for only $14.95, call toll-free 1-800-432-9453.